topic impacts us in the work that we do, working with a vulnerable learning populations. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for the graciousness of turning your camera on. I have turned that recording on. I'll make that recording available after the webinar if you are in fact interested in that. Here is the agenda today. Uh, in that chat box, go ahead and give me a question mark. That question mark is the interactive way of saying, hello lady, What's the agenda for today? So here's the agenda. Today we're gonna to talk about mental wellness. First, what we'll do is we'll create a definition of what mental wellness is. That's one of the challenges that we have in this field is that you and I, and you and I being um, educators and professionals that work in this field, do not necessarily have a shared um, definition about what mental wellness is. Once we have that definition, we will then look at eight strategies related to mental wellness that you and I can use um, in our classrooms and in our programs in working with um, at-risk learners to make a difference in the work that we do. Let me share with you a few norms of engagement. Thank you so much for those of you who turned your camera on. I really appreciate that. You might want to grab you um, some pen and paper. Miss Rochelle, look at Miss Watson. I'm so happy to see you. I hadn't seen you in such a long time. I hope you are well. Look at that. I mean, you just hopped on and I was already on top of you like that. I'm so sorry. Please make yourself comfortable. I was just happy to see your face. Um, you're on mute. Feel free to unmute at any time. This is informal in the sense of um, communication. It's just you're on mute to begin with. So it makes it easy for me to facilitate. If you'll find that chat box. And a specific question for you in that chat box, we'll use that chat box to interact and for me to direct focus and attention throughout the webinar because I, my goal is to model the Mockingbird strategies that we teach and many of the strategies that Mockingbird teaches are very much uh, revolved around engagement and attention. In that chat box, if you could give me just a little bit of context about what your role is in your organization, you don't have to get crazy with it. Just tell me what your role is so that I can best um, cater this webinar and this information to your role. And that information helps me do that. So if you'll find that chat box, give me a little context about what your role is, teacher. And if you don't mind giving your location, that that is um, pretty fantastic um, as well. Taylor, thank you. Taylor, can you tell me like what age group and stuff that would help um, me if you have that information? Gotcha, Taylor. Well, you were fast on that too, lady. I like it. Uh, I should also introduce you to the lovely Matthew McConaughey. You see him lurking over my shoulder there. He is my boyfriend. He does stalk me. Those are just things we need to get away, um, get out of the way. I will interact with him a little bit as we go through the webinar because he is my uh, teacher, my co-teacher here as we go along. Thank you. I'm reading these program director for youthful ages, Joseph. Ah, uh, Joseph, tell me what youth build program. I have deep connections to youth, but I'm just curious. Good principles to earn there. Ah, Mary, I'll take good care of you. Got it. Okay, thank you, guys. That gives me wonderful context. Um, this is multi-sensory, which means we'll use this chat box. We will use um, this camera also to get to navigate our interactions together today. Now, without further ado, let us get started. First, let me give you just a brief context of who Mockingbird is. That's important to the work um, that you're going to see today. It's always important to know that frame of reference. Mockingbird Education is a consultant organization. I am Tamara Thompson. I'm CEO and founder of Mockingbird Education. I'm coming to you from Dallas, Texas, uh, but our work really goes all over the world internationally. We're doing quite a bit of work right now in Central America, and then, of course, we work um, throughout the United States. And we essentially do three things. Um, those three things are train educators in instructional strategies that are um, appropriate for vulnerable learners. We design curriculum based on those strategies. And then we also help um, develop organizations and create programs and help programs improve their effectiveness in working with vulnerable learners. That is the nutshell of what we do at the center of everything that we do. And it's relevant to our work today is really about um, vulnerability and how does vulnerability impact the learning brain? What Mockingbird Education does is we study how these factors impact the brain. And we help educators and practitioners understand um, the biopsychosocial, huge word, biopsychosocial, the biopsychosocial implications of vulnerability. 
how does vulnerability impact cognition, psychology, sociology, sociological factors like your background, your income, all of those factors impact learning. Um, trauma being a huge one, trauma is basically the combination of all of these factors. How do those factors impact um, the learning brain? We help create common language around that, a common understanding of what does it mean to be vulnerable and how does that impact what you and I do in a classroom and in a program? And then beyond that, what are the strategies that you and I can use in our programs, in our classrooms, in our counseling, um, in our consulting to build better relationships and to effectively teach more compassionately and responsibly? At the heart of everything that we do is these four things, how to make learning visible and transparent, make learning active and collaborative, make learning psychologically safe, and make learning socially um, non-threatening. And at the center of that is how can you and I be good coaches, facilitators, and mentors, of which mental wellness is going to impact all three of those roles. Before we even get started, let me share with you that it's important to me that I respect the gradient um, of risk, meaning that some of the strategies that I'm going to share with you are advanced and some of them are entry point strategies. It doesn't matter where you're at in this continuum. I'm going to show you a buffet of ideas. Take what you can where you're at um, and maintain that connection with Mockingbird so that we can help you reach those next levels of success with the information that you're working with today. Now, that being said, that's who we are. Let's dig into this mental wellness. If you'll give me an MW in the chat box, that MW literally stands for mental wellness. Let me ask you a couple of questions just to get us grounded. Here's the first one. If you had 10 students in a classroom, how many, from your point of view, do you anticipate would struggle with mental health challenges, whatever your definition of mental health challenges is? Give me that number in the chat box if you don't mind. Thank you, thank you. And I'm asking because it gives me a little bit of context of how you frame this problem for yourself as you work. Okay, thank you. That Wow, look at those numbers. And then a second question to that, which is how comfortable are you with discussing and integrating mental health in your program or classroom? I totally acknowledge that this is a wide range. Behind this number, will you give me an exclamation point? That just helps me distinguish it from the answer before that. So give me nine exclamation point, three exclamation point. And please don't be afraid to go, hey, man, I'm not particularly comfortable with that because I don't want to open that um, can of worms, right? Yeah, thank you. I'm watching his responses come across. Perfect, perfect. So let's start here. Here's the biggest challenge that I've seen. So I've been doing this work for about 25 years, working with programs and schools and students who obviously are going to be struggling um, with mental wellness. And one of the challenges that I see in this work is you and I don't have a common language about what mental wellness is. So here's my first question to you. How do you define it? If I was to ask you to define mental wellness, not illness, mental wellness, how would you define it? If you don't mind, don't worry about grammar, spelling, any of that. Give me a little bit of a brainstorm in that chat box. I want to give you a moment to think about that. How would you define mental wellness? Question is, how would you define mental wellness? Thank you, guys. Ability to recognize emotions and skills to handle something that interrupts our typical day. The ability to recognize emotions and skills to handle. I like it. Just giving you a little background music here. Baseline stability and ability to complete daily fun life functions. Taylor, I like it. Strategies and resources. Mary, I can work with it. Ability to recognize and provide strategies and resources. Comfortable with yourself. Yeah. And look at this. All of us across that board feeling safe and secure mentally and emotionally. Thank you. 
Thank you for responding in that chat box. So when you look at these definitions, what unites all of us in this work is that all of us work with vulnerable learners. And although there's probably a thread that unites all of those responses, you could also see that there's some differences among what we would state as mental wellness. Kathy, state of our minds well-being to be able to interact with our environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Excuse me a second, letting someone in the room there. So let me give you some research, and it's not good research. In fact, go ahead and say this when we say boo. And by boo, I mean this is negative research coming at you. And it's this. By nearly every metric, student mental health is worsening, regardless of how you and I are going to define it for a moment. 60% of college students met the criteria for at least one mental health problem last year. Almost three-fourths of students reported moderate or severe psychological stress. And then counseling centers have seen an extraordinary increase on demand over the last decade. Now, I know many of you come to this work and you are not necessarily working with college students. And I appreciate that and respect that if you come from that youth build component or you come from that youth development component. Think about this. This is 60%, this first statistic right here, of college students who have arguably um, better conditions than those conditions that our students have when they are in youth build, right? The instability that uh, our students may have if you're working in ABE, adult basic education, youth services, so on and so forth. So I offer that statistic not because it represents our population, because, but because that represents potentially the group of students who are doing the best in terms of mental wealth if you were just to look at their biopsychosocial um, profile. Here's the mental health challenges, the most frequent mental health challenges that students indicate. Now, in looking at mental wellness, this was a topic that Mockingbird avoided for a really long time because the problem is this big and where do we start? And as we started working with programs on the solution, it was important to us that we looked at this. You and I know this list right here, right? That we need to include mental health education. This is the obvious. And that chat box, go ahead and give me an O for obvious, because today I want to move beyond this. All of these things that you see on the screen right here, Matthew, say it with me, say these things are true. Thank you, Matthew. All of these things are true, but that isn't going to help you and I necessarily in this moment of the classroom right now because you and I know those and either you and I are already working on them or they are outside of our dimension of control. So I share that with you because the strategies I want to share with you are things that you and I can do as practitioners in the work that we do. We're going to look at eight mental wellness strategies. To look at those strategies, first I want to describe this context of working with at-risk learners for a second and mental health. I think of at-risk learners a little bit like a saltwater aquarium and working with at-risk learners, right? In a saltwater aquarium, think about what you and I would have to do if you and I were to maintain the health of that saltwater aquarium. So let me push a question to you. Our classrooms are like a saltwater aquarium. Think about just the aquarium for a second, not our students. If you were to maintain the health of this saltwater aquarium, what are some of the things that you and I would have to do in order to do our jobs effectively as a saltwater tank manager? Comments on that in that chat box? Matrika, thank you. Matrika, I'm hoping I'm saying your name right. If I'm not, I, I, I apologize. Daily maintenance, yep. Balance levels, test pH. Think about who's in the tank. Pay attention to the water. Rochelle, I love it. Sarah. I see you letting Rochelle do all that typing. Good for you. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, so think about this. You have to have specialized knowledge about the individual students, the individual fish, right? You have to have specialized knowledge about how those fish interact together. Thank you, Kathy. You have to um, think about how all of that interacts together. Now, let me ask you the flip of that. How is that analogy, thank you, Mary, pH nutrients balance, how does that compare to the work that you and I have to do in terms of mental health? So flip that analogy. That saltwater aquarium represents your students and maintaining the mental health and wellness of your classroom. What are the responsibilities of us as a facilitator in that context? Let me ask that question again. A saltwater aquarium is like maintaining the health and balance, mental health and balance of our classrooms. What is that analogy and similarity? Very similar, maintaining mental wellness in the classroom, right? The environment, who gets along with who. Yeah, and think about this. Although each of those fish have specialized needs, right, if these were students, this student may be struggling with trauma. This one may be maybe struggling with toxic stress. Um, this core right here may have anxiety issues. There are some standards across the board that all of us need to be aware of in order to provide a stable environment for all of those students, regardless of their individual conditions, correct? And that becomes the most difficult thing of our job. What are the universal things that you and I can do to maintain the health and well-being of a classroom and our students directly with their mental wellness challenges. Um, what are those factors? Those are the factors that I really want to focus on. Or what are the eight things that you and I can do regarding mental wellness that impact that are universal and that impact all students, but not necessarily the specialized challenges of any individual student? Does that make sense? To do that, we have to look at mental this mental wellness wheel so this wheel represents oh excuse me i have somebody trying to come in let me admit somebody this wheel represents the eight strategies that we look we'll look at now if you have that handout woohoo hooray for you but if you don't have that handout and even if you do will you please find a blank piece of paper and when you have that blank piece of paper just hold that up to the camera we're going to draw this image. Stay with me. I'll tell you why. The, uh, look at you, Barbara, with it already handed out. I'm loving it. Um, if you hand up that blank piece of paper, I'm going to give you just about 30 seconds a minute to draw this image. Draw this image as fast as you can. Don't forget to number it. I'll, of course, give you some good music for that because that's what I do. Hello, Miss Gale. I'm happy you're joining us. As you draw that, I'll give you a little bit of context. Imagery is the universal language. Um, I shared with you that the strategies that Mockingbird use are related to attention and engagement. And right now I'm directing the focus and also digging you deeper, priming you, if you will, with the content and information. Learning is always better when it's active. Yeah, so take a minute to draw that picture and, oh, I'm sorry, I will do the same. It's important as an educator that we always model the same behavior that we would want our learners to engage in. So let me draw these as well. Doesn't have to be Picasso. What we're going to do is we're going to draw them and then as we go through, we'll label them. Don't forget to number it. You have your picture if you'll just hold it up to that cameras or give me a G for got it in the chat box. There's mine really quickly. Look, oh, I didn't number mine. Shame on me. Hang on. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. 
There's mine. Yeah, when you have yours. Thank you, Miss Gill. I see it. Thank you, Miss Mary. All the good luck when we're all alone. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. I see it in the chat box. Always focus on the behavior you want more of. So as soon as learners respond, make sure you acknowledge that behavior. You will get more of that behavior. Thank you, Joseph. I got it. Yeah, so let's talk about these strategies. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at eight strategies. These, This graphic organizer helps us organize the information as we go through it. Um, thank you, Ms. Gee. Got it. Let's look at number one. So let me give that big picture once again. These are eight strategies for mental wellness that you and I can gauge in a classroom that can make a positive difference in mental wellness and help you and I find an entry point to attacking this challenge of mental wellness, right? So look at number one. In that chat box, go ahead and give me a number one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for responding. Here's number one. All of these images represent the meaning of the strategy or our visual cues to help us remember what the strategy is. What is number one? Number one is going to seem like the most simple strategy in the world, and it is, and it's the most underutilized strategy that you and I have at our disposal related to mental wellness, and it is this. We need to define, see that label right there? We need to define mental wellness and prioritize, and I'll share with you what that means. So number one, if you don't mind, on your picture, right, define and prioritize, define and prioritize, and I'll share with you what that means. Either with your students or with your staff, depending on the work that you do, you and I need to create a definition of what mental wellness is and what is needed to create a psychologically safe environment. Here's the challenge. Mental wellness, the definition is about this big. Kathy has a definition of it. Shelly has a definition of it. Rochelle has a definition of it. Gail has a definition. And all of us are talking about different things. And if you and I are in a classroom together, particularly if you're working with students, what you and I need is a shared definition of what mental wellness, not illness, what mental wellness is. Now, this is a two-parter. Stay with me, okay, because I'm going to give some very specific things to keep in mind about this. So what does this literally mean? It means literally with students, we need to define, hey, what is mental wellness? If you're working at the organizational level or at a team level, it is, okay, let's create a shared definition of mental wellness so that you and I can begin to prioritize, which is that next part. What are the priorities? There's this much stuff to do in mental wellness. What are you going to do in the next six weeks, in the next six months, in the next year? If we don't prioritize, we'll boil the, we will boil the ocean, so to speak. Stay with me for just a moment. By stay with me, I mean hang on. Let me explain that whole piece of that, and then I'll put it back together for us. We need to create a shared definition of what mental wellness is and what is needed to create a psychologically safe environment. Now, in your chat box, go ahead and give me an exclamation point. And that exclamation point is a cue for this right here. At surface level, that seems really easy, right? Like, okay, great. Let's create a definition of mental wellness, one that you and I can use with students or with staff or whatever your um, hierarchy or scope is. But there's something to keep in mind about the definition. When you approach this conversation, um, when you approach this conversation with students or with staff, there's a couple of things that we need to be aware of. I want to share with you some cultural differences that we know from the research about how different um, minority populations, ethnic populations manage mental wellness and mental illness. And I share that with you because it will help you frame the conversation about mental wellness. There are cultural differences in the United States on how people understand, interpret, and manage mental health. And because, obviously, um, your demographic may be incredibly diverse, it's important to understand what some of those trends are. 
So let me share with you a couple of these trends. And please keep in mind that these trends are research um, based, meaning that this comes from the research on, um, and I have the source, you'll see it at the source at the bottom of the page here in just a second. But first, let's check some assumptions. Take a look at these labels right here. These are ethnic and race labels. What do you think the response and understanding of mental wellness is and the differences among these groups? I'm not going to ask you to put that in the chat box, but just in your mo on your own mind's eye for a second. It was pretty enlightening to me uh, when I was uh, first began digging in this work. I hadn't really thought about that at this depth. I mean, I understand it in retrospect, right, of seeing the research and then going, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I hadn't really thought through it. And I can also share with you that without being able to articulate it specifically, this was part of my concern in talking about mental wellness, but I hadn't really made that connection, right? Thoughts on what some of these differences are. So let me share with you what a couple of these are. So let's look at uh, white or European first. Here's the research trend. Caucasians are the most likely of all cultural groups in the U.S. to seek outpatient therapy services. Now, the reason may be varied, right? It might be access. It may not necessarily be cultural approval, but forget that what the reason is for just a second, just the understanding that this group is the most likely of all cultural groups to seek outpatient therapy. Racial and ethnic minority groups in the U.S. are less likely to seek outpatient therapy. Let's look at African-American uh, minority populations. Here's the trend. African-American communities have an active approach in handling adversities independently and directly. And what the research shows is they rely most heavily on spiritual resources for emotional support. Think about that when you start thinking about these conversations about mental wellness. And what does that mean when you're having those conversations? Let's look at this one. Latino populations are less likely to trust mental health providers compared to white families. They're more likely to rely on social support from when their own community and family. They often focus on, and I find this um, fascinating and true from my personal experience, they often focus on the physical symptoms of mental illness, such as trouble sleeping, loss of appetite, and they're less likely to discuss thoughts or feelings that are bothering them. In other words, they tend to focus on the physical manifestation of mental wellness and not the spiritual and emotional. Again, these are trends in research. Let me share with you just two more. Asian Middle Eastern research trends. Men Concern that mental health treatment will bring shame and dishonor to the family. Children have described feeling pressure to appear perfect and successful and therefore to keep their symptoms secret. For Middle Eastern family, adolescents research has found that they tend to seek support from other family and religious community members. Again, think about this in working with our population on defining a term for mental wellness and how culture may impact that discussion. And then finally, let me share with you Native and Indigenous research. Native and Indigenous people in America report experiencing se serious psychological distress at 2.5 times more than the general population. And are also, by the way, less likely to receive it and seek treatment, which isn't actually on that slide. Now, so first, we have to create a definition of mental wellness, right? And it's important to understand that that cultural lens will impact that definition. But how is mental wellness different than mental illness? Because in society and in pop culture, we often conflate these two um, definitions, if you will, of these concepts. What's the difference between mental illness and mental wellness? The difference often also prevents us from having this conversation. Now, I don't know what your definition, your distinguishing definition is between the two. I'm not going to ask you to put that in the chat box necessarily, but let me give you and I a definition, if you don't mind, of mental wellness so that we can progress this conversation forward. In that chat box, go ahead and give me a question mark. And that question mark is just, um, hey, what is the definition that you would use? 
considering those cultural implications of and that you and I can use to move forward. Um, Rochelle, thank you. I see that direct message. Nah, it, it'll just be notes, okay? And here's the definition that I like to use. Here's the definition. Mental wellness is the state of your mind's well-being. The state of your mind's well-being. And there are three mental wellness skills that I want to help young people or help my students develop. You might want to take you a screenshot of this. I would share with you that this definition um, and these skills have been have been used as a definition in lots of programs. And the feedback is, hey, this one doesn't have a, as, uh, cultural triggers. This is a pretty safe definition, a unifying definition to use across different groups of learners. Here's what I like about this definition is one of the things I like about this definition is it has three skills that all of us can grow in. And that's important because one of the important elements of mental wellness is that you and I want to model both the struggle and the success that we have in that day-to-day -day interaction with mental wellness. So here's a definition. The state of your mind's well-being, and there's three skills that we, you and I really need to be mentally healthy. We need to have self-awareness. We need to have the ability to regulate and manage emotion. And we need to have awareness of others and the ability to manage social relationships, which means I need to be aware of Gail's emotional state and Joseph's emotional state and mental state in addition to my own. Mental wellness. That's the definition that I use with young people and that I would use with staff. Now, what is mental illness? Here's mental illness. Diagnosed and undiagnosed conditions that affect thoughts and behaviors. I should probably add to that negatively affect thoughts and behaviors, right? It's kind of an assumption there that it's there. Now, here's a question for you. On your staff, on a scale of 1 to 10, does your staff share a unifying definition of mental wellness? 10 Give me this in the chat box. I'm just trying to um, gauge a temperature check, if you don't mind. Ten being like, yeah, I think that we have a very specific definition of what that is. Um, one, two, and three of no. Like, we've never even had the conversation. I'm not even sure if we have that. Do you mind giving me that in that chat box? It just gives me a little context of where different programs might be with this concept. Yeah, got it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing. So once you have that definition and that distinction between mental wellness and mental illness, and let me share this, that seems so simple when you see it on the screen, but how many times in your conversations with staff and with students are you talking about illness and not wellness? Like all of us need to be promoting and all of us can be integrating mental wellness in our programs. That's very different than addressing mental illness. I have seen in programs where staff are uncomfortable with mental wellness, they're not really uncomfortable with mental wellness. What they're uncomfortable with, and rightly so, is opening the door to having conversations about mental illness and not being prepared for those, which I think is a very legitimate um, concern. So first we have to define it, and then we have to do this right here. What are your three biggest priorities? that will have the biggest impact on student mental health. Joseph could do a thousand things. He has this much stuff. He has this much stuff to teach and he's got this much time to do it in. So what are the three manageable things that you can do and that you and your staff can do in the next six months, six weeks, whatever that is. And the goal isn't necessarily in this moment to go, here's what my priorities are, but to encourage you to go, okay, you gotta start somewhere need to have the conversation of what are your three priorities because without those priorities here's what you do you boil the ocean and you get nothing done and then shelly gets burned out because she tried to do 15 things instead of just narrowing down and doing two things and trying to be really good at those two things because the need is going to be constantly popping up and without priorities you're going to scatter yourself across the board trying to meet mental uh, I mean, learners' mental wellness needs. So consider three priorities. I'm going to share with you the three priorities that I have worked most recently with. 
at an organizational level. Those are broad strokes, admittedly broad strokes, but the goal when I was working with these priorities was to even get this topic on the map for staff and program. Does that make sense? So that's why it's it's broad strokes to begin with. Here's the goal. This semester we are working on mental wellness. We need to start creating a definition with that with our student and here's our here are our priorities to prevent stressors, to promote wellness and to connect students to resources. This connects student to resources uh venn diagrams over into mental illness right so what are your priorities now so one is this one is to define mental wellness distinguish it from illness and then determine three priorities that's your goal if you could do that in the next, when you walk out of this webinar, if you will start thinking through just number one, you'll start narrowing down this mountain into achievable mohill to get started. But let's keep going. Are you ready? Give me number two in that chat box. Give me number two. Let's look at number two. Look at that picture for number two. What do you think that picture represents? Good guess, Miss Shelley. Good guess. Community, because she sees um, those pictures. Rochelle, thank you. Looking closer. Yeah, so that magnifying glass represents screening. And here's big picture for just a second. People's perceptions. Thank you, Gil. Make it easy for students to self-screen for potential challenges. Now, you're a program that doesn't have resources. That's okay. Hang on. I'm going to give you some tools that make screening um, informal tools that will help you with some of that screening. Make it easy for students to self-screen. Too many programs have these elaborate formal um, screening mechanisms on mental wellness. And because they're elaborate and you have to get the student out of class and all of those factors that go with that, it creates challenges. Think about screening in two ways, formal and informal. Yes, you need formal screening. Put that aside. You and I probably don't have a lot of impact on the formal screening that happens at your program, but we can impact informal. Give me an I in that chat box. That I stands for informal, and I have impact on informal. Here's what that means. Informal is unstructured tools used by staff and students for temperature checks. Now, in the resources that you have, I wanted to share with you that all of the screening tools right here, I'm going to give you some kind of formal and unstructured. These screening tools that you see in those resources, there's different ones for anxiety, for um, depression. All of these are like 10 questions or less. They're screening tools. They're not these heavy, elaborate, uh, formal tools. These are snapshots that allow a student and staff to make decisions about what that next step might be just from a health perspective. I like these tools. They help learners, individual students and staff identify like what might be needed next. But let me share with you my favorite tool to use just in a program and in a classroom. Are you ready? So know this. In the resources link that you have, there is a link to these type of uh, these tools. All you need to do is Google these tools by their name, and you'll find, I think every single one of them is a free access tool. But let me share with you one that's much more practical than that, which is this right here. When learners come into a program, and I think it was Ms. Gee who said, it's monitoring that daily condition, right? It's about mental wellness. It's about being able to regulate our emotions and our mental state. I love this tool right here. It's called, Are You Drowning or Are You Thriving? I simply ask owners, which one of these pictures best describes you today? Talk to me. Are you drowning? Are you struggling? Are you surviving? Are you performing? Or are you thriving? It's just a simple visual. I put it at the front of my PowerPoints. I have it on a handout. I can ask staff the same question. Can I please share with you that the research shows from COVID after COVID and the pressure that you and I have had and the work that we do as teachers that you and I are struggling from mental wellness as well? Where are you at on this scale right now? 
Many of you are at the end of a semester. Are you drowning? Are you struggling? Are you surviving? One of the elements of mental wellness, in fact, the biggest one, the biggest skill is this, awareness of our individual state. This tool, as simple as it is, and by the way, it is simple. I think the tool that you have in the resources looks like this. It gives you some words to describe those states. Allows you and I to have a common language about mental wellness. I can say, hey, Sarah, uh, you know what? I think that Mark, I don't know. They seem nervous. They seem irritable. They, need, they seem sad. This gives you and I common language, but it also gives us common language with students. And here's something important to know about um, language. Vulnerable learners lack language to talk about emotions. That's research that shows that a vulnerable learner may be angry but not have the language to talk about anger. And this scale helps a learner who may not be able to describe to you this, tired, poor sleep, poor appetite, but can tell you I'm struggling and start to attach labels to that state. In your chat box, go ahead and give me an A. That A stands for awareness. This tool is about awareness. It's awareness for the learner, but it's also an awareness for the staff about the mental and emotional state of the learner. Such a simple, simple tool. And that link, it's um, on, I think this link is in your resources. For those of you who are part of the Mockingbird um, community, you have access to this um, in the methodology platform. I know that's some of you on line here. Question for you. In your chat box, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being like, yes, I could see how I could use this in my classroom and in my program. Give me um, a response, if you don't mind, from 1 to 10 being like, 10, yeah, I could definitely use this. 1 being like, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, that's your scale. Okay. Thank you. I'm asking so because I don't want to beat that horse to death, so to speak, right? I just, it's such an easy tool. And what I find is sometimes when you see an easy tool, we over, um, we underestimate the value of the tool, right? Because it's like, oh, that's simple. Let me take us back. Here we go. Let's look here. So one is define and prioritize. Two is to identify screening tools, formal and informal. The one I shared with you was an informal tool. Go ahead and take a look at number three. Ideas, let me blow up number three for us. Ideas on what three is? Michelle, I see you thinking. Communication tools, I like it's talking. Yes, yes, yes. La. Yeah, so let me, we're all hitting all around it. So let me share with you. Go ahead and write this one down for number three. This is talking tools, and I'll explain what that means. Talking tools. You can see that uh, y'all are catching on to this imagery game, right? Here's the imagery. This is talking. It's talking tools, and here's what that means. Talking tools are the same tools that are used in therapeutic settings can be used in a classroom. For example, that mental wellness spectrum, that we just use, that's a talking tool. It is a vehicle that allows the student and the teacher or the student and the student, whoever those two interactions exist between, um, it makes that conversation safe and easier when you have a talking tool. I'll give you an example that is from therapy um, that everyone can probably relate to or have seen it in a movie or perhaps personally, you know, when they talk to small children who don't necessarily have their labels for their emotions, they often use dolls. Right now, I'm not advocating that you use dolls with vulnerable youth and or older adult basic education um, students. However, don't be afraid to use tools that I'll give you, this is one of my favorite ones, um, to use tools like Spot It cards. Are you familiar with the game Spot It? Love the game, but I often use cards like this. Here's another version of it. Um, I like this one too. Climber cards. Are you familiar with climber cards? 
Um, if you are not familiar with that, take a screenshot of that. And I would, this lady should pay me money. Um, I love her, her cards. Climber cards are just images on the card. And I will often say, okay, show me the image that best describes how you feel about such and such. Or find the image here. I saw that you and Maria were arguing in the hallway there. Show me the image that best describes how you were feeling in that moment. These are just tools that help us with the conversation. I have tools. Uh, I love imagery tools. These are the two of my favorite to use for imagery. I want to show you another one that's a different one. If you're a member of the Mockingbird community, you have access to this one. Oh, excuse me. Let me let somebody in. Let me share this one with you. So when you do intake and a student comes into your classroom or your program, one of the things that I do is I have these cards called mentor care cards. And those mentor care cards are, they outline different needs that a student may have. And those needs may be, I need help with transportation. I need help with health care. I need help with um, child care. I want to have better relationships with my students, teachers. It's a wide range. There's 16 different cards. Okay. So when I do intake with a student, I use these cards and we have this mat that you see right here. This is a mat that I made on legal paper, right? Just put some images on it. And I, and I use these cards and they sort through the cards and I go, tell me what are your priorities right now? And it helps me understand what the student's priorities are. And it decreases the psychological risk of talking about them because they're going through these cards and they're looking at the cards. And it's not this heavy conversation with this person that I just met about what my needs are. Does that make sense? Phenomenal tool to use also student to student interactions, meaning that I may take these cards and go with your partner. Um, go ahead and identify the three things that are most important to you right now. So maybe they have that conversation with a partner. But the point of the cards, whether you have access to them or not, you can create these type of cards that give a vehicle for a conversation and lower the risk of the conversation. So think about the difficult conversations that you have with students. When you identify what types of those conversations are, my next question is, could you use a talking tool to help you? This is an example of a talking tool. I found that it was difficult to have learners talk about what state they were in, but if they had pictures, they could say, yeah, that's me right there. That's an example of a talking tool. Uh, let me share with you another one. I often show learners, this is a good one to take a screenshot off. I often show learners this um, wheel right here and go, this is the goal is to be balanced. And then I have them put numbers on there to show me which ones of those are priority and which ones of those are um, out of balance. Again, here's the strategy. Use a concrete, multi-sensory visual tool to have to navigate the conversation. So number three is talking tools. So one is define and label, right? Not define and label. Define mental wellness, distinguish it from mental illness, and then prioritize. Two is to have informal screening tools. Three is to consider using talking tools that help learners discuss emotion and navigate emotion. I would write spot it out next to this because spot it cards are about the easiest one that you have access to very quickly. Any ideas on what four is? Look at four. This one's going to appear a little abstract. And if you've known Mockingbird, this one's a super obvious um, thank you, Ms. Gia. Self-love, I love it. It's going to be connected to that, of course. Talk about solution, self-growth, Michelle. Any other ideas? Whole person. Yeah, it is. Uh, Kathy just, oh, Kathy, you win the imaginary fruit basket. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are absolutely... No rewards in this webinar, but Kathy, I'm sending you imaginary chocolate, okay? Because you hit the words <laughs> exactly. Stay tuned, okay? Because there's a free imaginary car coming up too. Sarah, you don't want Rochelle to win the car, okay? You want to be able to win the car. It's imaginary 
It'll show up later this week. Here we go. Let's look at this one. This one is whole person learning. And here's the conversation of that. It's teaching that acknowledges that learning is a biopsychosocial process. So here's the entry point for that. So much of the time as teachers and counselors, we are talking about cognitively what a learner has to do. And I am suggesting that we move the conversation to recognize that emotion and social elements do play a role in learning. Now, we know that learning is a biopsychosocial process. You and I may know that, but do our students? Because if a student who has been up all night because they had a sick child comes into a classroom and is having a hard time concentrating, that isn't a reflection of their intelligence, which is how they feel. It's a reflection of they only have this much bandwidth mentally and they've already used it for the day. And now when they come into the classroom, they only have this much bandwidth. And you and I being open and transparent about that decreases vulnerability and increases compassion that learning is more than just what's in the learning process of cognition or in your head. That's an abstract tool. And by abstract, I mean, let me make it concrete. To make it concrete, start having a conversation about the role that emotions play in attention. Start having a conversation about the role that stress plays in being able to maintain focus. We are not transparent and overt enough about the learning process. We focus so much on test scores that we don't think about communicating that, you know what, maybe you struggled not because you didn't know the material, but because you couldn't focus because you have a child home that's sick. They need to hear that directly so they can make that connection to the work that they do in a classroom. That's what's a big one for me because the entire Mockingbird methodology is built off of that uh, process. Um, Here's the three roles that you and I have to play. As soon as you start inviting conversations about social emotional learning and the role that social so, um, sociology and emotions play, you are now a coach and a mentor. So my job is what I tell my learners in a classroom is my job in this classroom is absolutely to teach you biology. That was the subject that I taught. But it's also to help prepare you psychologically to stay engaged in this classroom as we go through the process of learning biology. That's my job, because learning is psychological, not just um, cognitive. Ready for the next one? So this is to start having more conversations about holistic interactions. Ready for five? Here's five, let's look at it. Give me a five in that chat box. Bum, 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 bum. So if four was to acknowledge the psychological and social elements of learning, not just emphasize, um, can you learn this and did you learn this? Number five is what we call framing strategies. I'm going to give you some very specific ones, okay? But let's talk about big picture for a second. It's to integrate strategies that frame psychology in a safe an approachable manner. You can't ignore emotions. I'll share with you what that means more specifically. I'm going to share with you three framing strategies, okay? These are three things that you and I can do in a classroom immediately to recognize the psychology of learning with students, okay? But here's what they do. They frame learning so that it's psychologically safe. That's the goal, which is what that image is about. Let me just prove framing to you. You and I can influence the psychology of learners through the words that we choose and the strategies that we use, the talking tools, if you will, of learners. Look at this image right here. Our goal is to frame learning so that it's psychologically safe. And the words that we choose, just like this frame right here, direct attention and focus on how a student perceives their learning experience. Let me prove that one more time. Every single one of these images right here is framed to influence your perception, right? So let me share with you three strategies that frame learning 
so that it is more psychologically safe. I don't know if that was great English. Here's what the three are. So this is the first strategy. Here's the second strategy, and here's the third strategy. Take you a screenshot of that. I would be, so you can um, come back to these because these are the ones you can use in a classroom, like later this afternoon, even. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. So here's the first one. The first one is what I call reach inside. Now I want to teach this to you a multi-sensory. Here's what that means. Go ahead, take your hand out like this right here. Take your hand up, up like this. Now reach inside. Now reach forward like you're reaching into the heart of the student. Here's what that means. Reach inside is that we reach inside the student and we acknowledge their mental, emotional, and physical state directly. Reach inside means that when we see a learner in a state that we go, Rochelle, man, I know you're tired. Gail, I see that you're frustrated. That is an actual strategy. Good people skills is strategy. And a way that learners feel recognized and feel like, oh, you see me and feel safe is when Shelly can say, I notice that you're, uh, I sense that you're frustrated. I sense that you're tired. Labeling the emotion that you see is a powerful strategy to reduce in psychological risk and giving words to the experience. And here's what we know about verbal labeling. Research indicates that Labeling emotion, if it's a negative emotion, it decreases the power of the negative emotion. Think about that for just a second. So, for example, if I say to Shelly, I say, whoo, Shelly, I see that you're frustrated. I Research shows that I literally have reduced Shelly's frustration just by labeling it as frustration. Ooh, see, I see, Barbara, I see that you're tired. I see that you're stretching. Um, I see that you're carrying, it seems like you're carrying a lot of weight. Just by acknowledging, and you can be wrong about the state, but the attempt to acknowledge the state that the learner is in reduces a negative state if we label it. And here's the second thing that it does. Remember that priority, that skill of mental wellness is about awareness? Learners often do not have the language to talk about their emotions and their experiences. And when we say, Gail, I recognize that you're working this math problem and it's, ugh, it seems like you're frustrated. Now she has labels for her frustration. I'm giving her tools to talk about her experience. Research shows that anger and outburst, many of those angers and outbursts in small children, we recognize as angers and outbursts because they do not have the language. The same thing is true as that learner matures. A personal side story, I'll be very, very quick. I have a um, daughter who is deaf and I adopted her when she was 10 years old and she lived for 10 years without language. Like literally she only knew about 50 signs um, when I adopted her. My family learned sign language alongside the beautiful young lady that I adopted. She's 23 now. When I adopted her, um, her expression of emotion and frustration was I throw this big fit on the floor with my hands wailing and, you know, I mean, massive demonstration. She now has language to talk about, I am frustrated, I am mad, I am angry, I am happy. And just by saying to her, I see um, that you're rolling your eyes. So I anticipate that you're a little frustrated with me. I know that seems so silly, but can I tell you, it has a huge impact on feeling seen and also learning the language that I need to communicate about my emotions effectively. I didn't mean to go personal, but I've just seen that one over the years become such a powerful um, strategy. Now, let me, excuse me, let me go back there. I said you, I told you there was three. The first one is reach inside. Let me share with you this next one. First one is reach inside. The second one is acknowledging the voice inside your head. Look at this one. So here we go. You have a voice inside your head. Philip, you have a voice inside your head. Mary, Laura, you have a voice inside your head. That was the voice right then that just said, no, I don't. That was it right there. 
<laughs> Everybody has a voice inside their head, that little angel and demon that sits on our shoulder. Internal dialogue is the voice inside our head. And here's what we know about it from an academic perspective, by the way. An academic voice, that voice that says, oh, what's the meaning of this paragraph and what was the main idea? That is a learned skill, not a natural skill. So first of all, know this academic dialogue is a learned skill. Many of our learners are missing that skill academically, and we need to bring it out loud and make it visible. However, just the dialogue of the story you tell yourself about yourself impacts all of these factors. We know that. That's old news to you and I. But here's my question to you. Are you communicating that? Uh, sure, no worries, Kathy. Um, are we communicating that to learners? One of the most powerful teaching experiences I have ever experienced was um, a con working with a prison system and teaching some educators in a prison system to teach their students about this internal dialogue that they have. And it was fascinating to see grown men who had never, who knew that they had this internal dialogue, but had never had it labeled before. Once they have understanding, remember, that mental wellness is about awareness. Once they have the understanding that they have a voice inside their head, the second question is, do you have some deep ruts? <laughs> Think about a tires that have just grinded a pathway through the mud. Many of us have negative beliefs that look like this. Deep, deep programming of negativity. I share that with you to share with you that once we have internal dialogue, what I recognize is that students either have a positive internal dialogue or a negative, and most of them are negative. And so one of my goals is to teach learners that they have an internal dialogue and then to help reframe that dialogue so that it moves from this, you are not good enough, you can't learn, you're stupid, why do you even try, these deep habits to this. You are amazing. Hey, Tamara Thompson, you're amazing. Matthew McConaughey is totally in love with you. You're so smart. You're improving every single day at what you do, trying to move that internal dialogue to that place. And the strategy is simple. Here's how simple it is. All you have to do is teach them they have a voice inside their head and then start sharing internal dialogue of your own out loud. We model it first, and then we teach it. I was just sharing you, with you a little of my internal dialogue, because a lot of my internal dialogue involves Matthew McConaughey, which is why he's over my shoulder. Now, let me share with you that third strategy real quickly related to um, these framing. So this one is to reach inside, right? I know you're tired. I know you're frustrated. Acknowledge the mental, physical, and emotional state of the learner. The second one is to share internal dialogue. Here's what internal dialogue is. Start recognizing that you have it, and we're going to start reframing it in this classroom. Remember, this is about mental wellness, which means everybody benefits from these strategies. And then here's the third one. One of my favorite teenage tools, I call it. My kids in my household say, don't you mockingbird me, mom. And here's what it means. This is one of my favorite ones. I call it a door opener. And the statement is this. I will simply say this. Talk to me. Talk to me. Tell me what you're thinking. That statement of a conversation prompt that opens a conversation. Here's the literal thing that you will say. Talk to me. You, you have a learner who comes into your classroom individually, into your office individually, or sit with a group of students, and you're trying to get an idea of what just happened or what they're feeling. I'll say, uh, Shelly, let's talk for just a second. Talk to me. Tell me what's going on. And I just leave it open-ended like that, and here's what I find. Whatever they say gives me insight into their 